discussing Frederick Law Olmsted and the U.S. Capitol grounds with our with our speaker Steve Livingood. Steve is the chief guide of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, a private non-for-profit organization chartered by the United States Congress to develop enhanced experiences related to the history of the Capitol building and the institutions that have been housed there. His specialty is interpreting the building with historical background on the meaning of activities and artworks as the icons of representative democracy, seeing familiar things from a deeper perspective. Mr. Lavengood has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from, from American University and a Master's of Arts in Recent U.S. History from Emory University. He has worked in various capacities in the, in the political and policy circles in Washington, culminating in his work for the Capitol Historical Society. He has been awarded the Tourism Industry Award by the Guild of Professional Tour Guides of Washington, D.C. for his work in promoting the interpretation of the Capitol building by professional city guides. He resides in the New Waterfront in Southwest Washington and has two grown children who grew up in Alexandria but now live in Arlington. Please be aware that the if you have any tech issues to email encorelearning.net. The chat has been disabled at this time. However, if you have questions during the presentation, you can type them in the question box and they will be addressed at the end. Thank you in advance, Steve. If you wanna get started, we're anxious to learn everything about the Capitol. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, and thanks to Encore Learning for letting me uh, come and talk today about this fascinating subject. I work for the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. I'm representing them today, but I'm also on the board of the National Association for Olmsted Parks. And uh, we are gearing up now for Olmsted 200. Next year is the bicentennial of Frederick Law Olmsted. And so we are uh, going about getting as much publicity as we can so that people begin to understand this man. Uh, he has been called the, uh, one of the most important people in the 19th century, and yet a lot of people don't know about him. So we want to spend some time. Uh, I could spend days talking about him, but in fact, I just I want to focus, since I only have an hour, on uh, the U.S. Capitol grounds. But who is Frederick Law Olmsted and what is the big deal? Well, Olmsted, uh, his dates are 1822 to 1903, and uh, he's the father of American landscape architecture. He saw landscapes as a necessity of urban civilization, uh, particularly beginning with New York City's Central Park. But from that, every other city in America wanted a major park, and so he popularized urban parks in America He's the source of the concept of park systems, not just a park by itself, but using parkways. Indeed, the whole, the word parkways originates with Olmsted and stream valley parks and contoured suburban street systems. He also happened to organize the precursor of the American Red Cross and the original Yosemite Park. That gives you an idea of the range of what he did. But to really understand its importance, you need to know about the concept of public parks. Public parks are owned and planned by local governments. Prior to, to this era, all parks were uh, uh, the province of rich people who allowed poor people to come and look at them. It might be uh, the king or the prince or the duke, uh, but uh, the idea of public parks owned and planned by local governments was new at that time. He did not, not originate the idea, but he is the one most associated with that concept in uh, the United States and is recognized around the world for his leadership. Public parks are democratic. They're one of the few things that the government has that are used by all classes of people. Olmsted recognized that they are necess necessary to health that clean air and natural waterways are very important for people. Uh, and that's why he put them in the middle of New York City. 
and that parks give us a peaceful feeling that relieves the anxieties of urban life. Uh, cities have come to recognize that all over the country, but it, that concept wasn't, didn't really exist until uh, Olmsted uh, began to point it out. Olmsted's parks in particular are natural. They are not obviously man-made or showy. And that's one of the characteristics, and we'll talk about that with, uh, concerning the Capitol grounds. That parks became a sign of successful government and society. Cities began to compete with each other as who could have the best and most innovative uh, urban parks. And he recognized that parks can't just be plopped down. They have to be planned far in advance and implemented over time and evolve with experience and use. All of these concepts are, are connected with public parks through Frederick Law Olmsted. As I said, 1822-1903 was born in Hartford, Connecticut to a prosperous and well-connected family that had settled in Connecticut in the 1600s. He had a private education, but he had a health problem and he ended up shipping out as a seaman to China at the age of 19 instead of going uh, to college. Uh, after he got back, he became a scientific farmer and he had a farm on Staten Island. The farmhouse still exists and is part of the New York City uh, uh, Park organization, but they have not fixed up the park yet. Uh, in 1850, he was hired as a journalist uh, to talk about scientific farming that he was doing at his farm and in other places. And in that connection, he visited England and saw what is in fact the first, first public park uh, in the Western civilization, Birkenhead Park uh, near Liverpool. And he wrote up uh, of his uh, travels and, in a book called Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. This is what first made him famous. So in, in 1852, he was sent to visit the Southern United States, particularly the cotton plantations for a new newspaper called the New York Times. And he wrote that up in another uh, book called Journeys and Explorations in the Cotton Kingdom. But originally he, it had consisted of letters back to the New York Times and the book itself was not published until 1861 in England, because it was not gonna make him popular in the United States. That book we know helped keep Britain out of the Civil War because this was the first economic analysis of the slave society. Uh, and so we know that nearly everyone who was involved in the decision-making in, in Britain as to whether they would recognize the South had a copy or is recorded as having read a copy of Olmsted's book. It is believed that that was one of the single most important factors in keeping uh, Britain out of the war. Now to understand Olmsted's career from this point, you have to know about Andrew Jackson Downing. That's his picture on the right there. Uh, he had a popular uh, publication called The Horticulturalist and uh, it wrote about landscape gardening. Now the difference of the two concepts is that landscape gardening looks at each plant and tries to emphasize it and make the specimens perfect and arranges them in, in very studied ways. They published some of Olmsted's writings and um, Downing was quite involved in the idea of creating Central Park he probably would have created Central Park, except that he died tragically in 1852 in a very famous steamship, uh, steamboat accident on the Hudson. Between 1857 and 1861, Olmsted was hired to supervise the construction of Central Park. Um, and, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, Calvert Vox was Downing's partner and he needed someone else to partner with him uh, in creating a plan for Central Park. Olmsted was only supervising the, the clearing of the land and uh, whatever were necessary changes, but they still hadn't decided on a plan. Well, he and Vox got together and came, came up in 1858 with what we call the Greensward Plan for Central Park. And it is the iconic uh, beginning of landscape architecture. Uh, and this is, it is from that plan that we date the whole concept of line, landscape architecture in what one looks at the entire ensemble of plants 
and not the individual plants themselves. And we'll talk some more about that. And I think that concept will be clear in a moment. In 1861, the Civil War broke out and the same people who had been behind the construction of Central Park and the creation uh, suspended uh, all of it so that all the men could go off and fight. And they wanted to do what they could for the war effort without actually sending their own sons out. Uh, and so um, they created what was called the United States Sanitary Commission. And this was a private organization uh, that the Congress authorized to take care of the soldiers themselves during the war, uh, including such things as sanitation and diet and, and uh, uh, getting supplies to them and this kind of simple things that the army didn't do a very good job of. And it was out of that organization that uh, Olmsted got acquainted with people that asked him to um, take to plan the U.S. Capitol grounds by 1873. Three. And I should add that the United States Sanitary Commission is the precursor of the American Red Cross, and that is the connection there. Now, Olmsted's legacy is the pro profession of landscape architecture. Uh, the portrait on the left is the last one. It's by John Singer Sargent, and it depicts him at the Biltmore Estate, which is, was his last uh, major um, uh, landscape. Uh, but uh, Olmsted formed a design firm and later headquartered it in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, and it still exists there um, uh, as a national historic site. Uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects he helped found and schools of landscape design across the United States. Uh, the whole concept of it uh, dates to Frederick Law Olmsted. By 1895, he was retired and, and uh, was senile enough that he had to be confined to McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts, which happens to be one of the places that uh, had, was commissioned a design a landscape design by Olmsted, but unfortunately they didn't follow his design and this distressed him for the rest of his life. He is buried in Hartford. The firm itself continued until 1980. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. is known as Rick Olmsted and, um, and his stepbrother, John Charles Olmsted, uh, carried on the firm as did many other uh, employees and it is now a National Historic Site in Belmont, Mass in, uh, I'm sorry, Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, the, the Frederick Olmsted papers are connected with that site. Uh, many of them are online now. They have more than 6,000 landscape plans that the firm did, tens of thousands of photographs. They were pi pioneers in using photographs or for planning purposes. There are even more blueprints and other drawings and more than a million documents that the firm gave to the National Park Service so that they could be preserved. These are his last two projects and in many ways his uh, famous ones, the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, 1892. He is considered the one who, who understood the whole thing and, uh, and is given a great deal of credit for what was in fact the most successful World's Fair in world history. And then the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, he designed the grounds for that in 1895, and that is, is his last uh, great legacy. But here is what uh, people thought of him. Fred, um, Daniel Burnham, the architect, uh, is the one who said this as Olmsted was retiring. He said, an artist, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. And that's the difference between landscape gardening, which Downing did, and landscape architecture, which Olmsted created. Now here is the Olmsted plan for the US Capitol. You can see uh, in the lower left corner there, it's kind of mouse eaten, uh, but this is the original and this is what the, um, uh, what the grounds uh, he proposed for the building. To give you an idea of how different it was, on the left is the previous plan that had been done by Thomas Walter, who was the architect of the two extensions on either end and of the famous dome. And this is what he proposed. And you can see it's frankly very pedestrian. Uh, 
not much creativity going on there. And you compare that with Olmsted and you begin to get an idea of what this man accomplished. Here's a photograph of the current grounds uh, after they had finished digging out the visitor center. And you can compare that with the plan and see that, that uh, uh, the officials at the Capitol are reverent about Olmsted's plan and do as, as best we can to preserve the brilliance of it. And so this is what I wanna go over and show how uh, Olmsted created a landscape as a frame for this building. I'm gonna talk about the design elements, particularly the, the ovals or uh, eggs in the front, but uh, I want you to look at the whole map at the moment and see that the trees are denser around their outer edge and they get, then they get thinner and thinner as you get toward the building. And, and uh, there are spots where he's trying to frame your view with the landscape that he's put in, but it's done in such a way that it looks like God put that tree there. Uh, it is not done in a, in a way that suggests that any human intervention, and this is the brilliance of Olmsted and the way he approached parks, is that he made it uh, emphasize the natural and made it all, in fact, contrived, but you don't have any sense of its being contrived. So we're going to start with these eggs in the front, and the object here was that uh, on the Capitol Square there, there are 21 streets that converge and 46 entrances counting the walkways. So Olmsted had to deal with this uh, in getting people to approach the building in an orderly way. Uh, prior to this, they, they had used fences to, to keep people from, from uh, coming into the parts of the park where they didn't want them to enter. But Olmsted felt you should have a natural feeling of approaching the building, but he in fact wanted to guide people. And so he does it with structures like these ovals. He is guiding people around to one side or the other so that they don't just come walking across the lawn. And uh, I'm gonna show, some, show you some photographs now that were taken from uh, where the white arrow is and give you a sense of it from above. This is from the terrace of the Library of Congress, and that's where you get your best view on the east front here. Um, I want to talk first about this low wall. It's, a, it's two stones high, and, it, and uh, you can see it curves around this and defines this egg uh, or oval, uh, but it's very subtle. It's not a do, do not just uh, keep off the grass sign. It's not a, an iron fence. Uh, it is just high enough that it's awkward for you to try to step over. So he's telling you, uh, keep off the grass, but very subtly. Now on the right, you can see the place where Olmsted's uh, design ran into modern realities. And this is the entrance to the visitor center, which had to be dug out underneath the front of the Capitol, but they wanted to pay respects to Olmsted's plan as they planned it. And so, uh, you can see that there's a walkway that follows the curve there, but uh, between those two orange arrows on the right uh, is the entrance of the visitor center that, that curves down. Um, now, to look at the wall itself, you can see where the white arrow is to the left of that is this two layer of stone, and that's the original Olmsted uh, wall. To the right of that arrow, you can see the wall is twice as high, and I've done a... a um, a close up here of it uh, to show you that the two bottom layers here are um, our Olmsted's wall. But they needed to double the size of it so that they could use it for security purposes. And they made it the height of those green bollards, which is where the white arrow is pointing, uh, because that's how high it needs to be to stop a truck or a tank or, or a bomb of some kind, uh, vehicle borne. And so rather than just copy the Olmsted wall, they decided to make it uh, uh, more plain so that it's clear that the top two layers have been added, but then they put the same cap on the wall. So they doubled the size of the wall and left it in the same place, uh, but made it into a security wall. And that is the way we've approached Olmsted's plan in 
in planning for the visitor center. Now, here is the curved walk that I showed you a couple of photographs ago. And on the left, it's sloping down uh, and the wall is getting higher. On the right, the wall is actually getting lower as you get down to the bottom. Uh, the two white arrows are in the same location uh, so that if you stand where the first uh, arrow is on the left, you're actually seeing what the arrow shows on the right. And so they have, again, paid respect to Olmsted's plan. They have kept his oval and kind of used it as an entrance. Unfortunately, the effect of that is to create what looks like a, approaching the mode of a castle, which is the wrong uh, feel for approaching the Capitol building. And so now they're allowing vines to grow up over that stone wall to mitigate the, the effect of, of a fortress. But these are the things that, that, that they've tried to pay attention to in, uh, in, um, in designing things to be added to Olmsted's landscape here. Uh, this photograph is taken down on Constitution Avenue. You can see where the white arrow is there. Uh, this is another low wall that appears down at the, toward the bottom of the hill and again defines the Capitol grounds and lets you know that it's something important here while still being fairly inviting, uh, letting you know that you can come in. So these walls occur all around the Olmsted plan. A couple of design elements on the east front there uh, uh, on the plaza. This is a fountain that was originally looked like the lower right photograph. It was called a rainbow fountain and there were lights inside that would shine on it um, and create rainbows in the, in the water. Unfortunately, the fountains are now on the roof of the visitor center and they leak. And they've tried a number of ways to get to, to deal with the leaks, but now they've kind of given up, I think, and, and um, they use them as planters. But this uh, magnificent bronze uh, container here is is an Olmsted element there on the Capitol grounds. Next to that is the, the curved seating along the ovals. Uh, on the left, you see the white arrows indicating uh, where, the, where this occurs. And the idea is that visitors can sit there and look at the Capitol. Uh, it's, a, it's a low bench, but it still serves the same function as that low wall uh, in uh, discouraging you from getting out on the lawn but it allows you to sit there and, and uh, he put to holes through the terracotta there so that you don't get too sweaty leaning against it. And, and it keeps it fairly cool there as a pleasant place to look at the Capitol. Uh, those uh, uh, street lamps there are uh, designed by Olmsted's team as well. The lower right photograph shows what we're, how we deal with the, with the necessities of, of the utilities there. Those are all wire uh, outlets for the television networks. And uh, this is a position along that low wall where uh, senators and congressmen give press conferences. The senators have one on their side and the, and the uh, uh, congressmen have another one on their side. And uh, rather than have all those remote trucks lined up here repeatedly for all of the speeches, they just decided to put in to hardwire the connections to the um, media outlets. And so that's what those are, but they're hidden behind that wall so you don't notice them from the outside. Uh, another design element up there on, on the front is the trolley stops. Uh, these are iron trellises that are designed for holding roses or wisteria. And uh, on the left at the top, you see the Senate as it appears in the spring. On the lower uh, one is the house side um, trolley stop with the wisteria growing up over it. Uh, that was taken a couple of years ago, so the wisteria will be uh, much fuller now. But that's the way Olmsted was dealing with, it, with the utilities of things that people needed to do rather than having you wait out on the street for the streetcar, he designed an area for the streetcar to come up to the Capitol and have an appropriate place for you to sit and look. The photograph on the lower right is the view. If you're sitting in the Senate's um, trolley stop, uh, you can look at the Capitol building while you're waiting for your trolley. It's this kind of thoughtfulness that makes Olmsted almost breathtaking in his uh, ability to understand what people do in parks. Now we're going to go over the west front, and this is defined by this big circle. 
Uh, you can see the green arrows here uh, indicating uh, what I mean by the circle. And the object is to get people from the west front, which is low and goes up a hill and take them gently up the hill through uh, what feels like a wilderness until they get to the Capitol building itself. Uh, so we're gonna walk up that in a, in a moment, but there was no, um, there was no uh, entrance to the building on that side. That had been the back side of the Capitol, but it faces the mall now. It didn't at that time, the mall didn't exist, although it was on L'Enfant's plan, it hadn't been built yet. So Olmsted had the problem of what to do with that and he saw the potential of the mall. Uh, so he created vistas, and you can see here the blue arrows show you the, uh, what it looks like uh, in the photographs I'm about to show you. You're looking those three views in these photographs. Down the center, of course, is the Washington Monument. Um, and you see, get the full sweep of the mall. Those buildings in the background are more than two miles away. Off to the left, you can see southwest, and there's a nice open... Uh, field there. On the right, you're looking to the northwest, and he put some trees there, but still the lawn is the same size. Here he's, he's trying to emphasize what, what is here and what is worth looking at uh, just by the landscape that he uses. Now, if you go to the bottom and look back up, this is the view that you get from down below, and I've shown that with the arrow uh, on the uh, map on the right. Uh, you can see that this whole landscape is designed to emphasize that building and make it look particularly wonderful. And it does now, in fact, that they've polished the marble and made the dome uh, match the rest of the building and so forth. So uh, long in advance, he was creating this frame for this magnificent building to let us know how important it is. Between those two, those three views are two avenues or walks. He called them alleys for the trees that he put on either side, which at that point were sycamores. Uh, once the sycamores died from the air pollution, uh, we've tried various other trees. And uh, the last I looked, uh, they, had, they had, to, had to take out the trees and they were trying again. I don't know what they'll be doing this year. But uh, this design that you can see is very much an Olmsted design. If you remember those benches that I showed you at the top of the hill, had this uh, red and blue pavement with white uh, emphases, and that's what is here. That's to subtly suggest the American flag uh, in, the, in the stones as you walk up to the building. But he aligned these two um, uh, walkways with the two avenues that end at the base of the Capitol. This is Pennsylvania Avenue on the right that we're looking up, and at the far end is the White House. Of course, you can't see the White House from here because the Treasury Building was built sticking out too far. Uh, but that's what you see at the end is the Treasury Building next to the White House. But this is the, this is the vista of Pennsylvania Avenue, which he's trying to emphasize with these walks. And then Maryland Avenue on the other side, which is not as dramatic nowadays, but when he was working, uh, the, what we call the 14th Street Bridge was actually the Maryland Avenue Bridge. And so that was the major way of, of uh, uh, getting to Virginia. Now you've got the big circle and you've got the panoramic views. And um, you're looking into and through the wilderness and we're gonna walk up the hill uh, and, and experience it as people do going up from the bottom to the top. Uh, he left openings uh, at the best aesthetic angles and um, glimpses of the goal at the top, uh, but the feeling of coming through the wilderness to come upon this building. You begin with gates. These uh, stone uh, gates and the low wall you see ends there with this uh, kind of an announcement that this is a sacred space that you're entering. It's a very subtle way of letting you know that, uh, that uh, this is different than the rest of the city. It is a place that we, that we um, revere. And you can see the same lamp in the, in the two photographs, one looking up the hill and the other looking back. And then you start into the wilderness. Uh, the view on the left is in the spring, the one on the, on the right is in the summer. 
Of course, the Capitol grounds have been fenced all fall, so I wasn't able to get, get any photographs from that. Um, but you can see the house office buildings on the right there, but they're, they're obscured and, uh, and the, the Capitol is uh, not in plain view either as you begin. And of course, in the summer, it gets more and more shaded, so it's a much more pleasant uh, place. Again, the spring on the left and the summer on the right. And uh, uh, you can see there's a fork in the road up here on the left, and you can see the same fork on the right there. Um, and that leads over to the plaza where I showed you uh, the vistas are. So that if people want to go to the, um, to the plaza and skip the steps, uh, then, uh, then you can go off to the left here. But the main walk it shows you is straight ahead, curving around and getting up to the top. Uh, the next view that we're gonna see is um, where the uh, woman in the blue top is standing, because this is where Olmsted wanted you to see the building. So here it is, this is the view that you get as you go up. Uh, those black fences aren't there anymore. That's when they were uh, starting to work on refurbishing the marble, which they did the, over the last couple of years. Uh, but this is the first glimpse that you get of the Capitol building from the location where that uh, white arrow is uh, on the map. And uh, if you turn around and look back down, you get a, again get a sense that's the spring on the left uh, and the summer on the right. Uh, get a sense of, of uh, what it's like looking back down. Then you continue, and again the Capitol is obscured. Uh, and these wonderful trees are there giving you a sense of, of um, uh, coming out of, the, out of the wilderness into the top. You get a few glimpses of the Capitol through the trees and then, uh, and this picture again shows you uh, with the white arrow where this photograph was taken. You're up even with the south side of the Capitol now. And then you get up to the top to the north, to the, I'm sorry, to the east, uh, where, which is where you can actually get into the building. And, uh, and at that point, then you, you encounter another plaza. If you turn around and look back down, uh, but off toward the office buildings, you get this wonderful sense of, of, uh, of a very pleasant wood that you're walking through. So a lot of congressmen, as they're running up to vote uh, on bills in the, in the house from their offices in those house office buildings that you see there, uh, get to come through this kind of a view uh, on their way to the building. Now I've moved all the way to the far uh, east side and show you what it's like to approach the Capitol from the corners. Uh, again, you have the sense of being in the wilderness and then coming out into a clearing where this magnificent building is. Olmsted is looking at, from, looking at the building from all angles and trying to give people the very best experience that, that he can uh, in, in uh, framing this building and setting the, um, setting the feelings that you're having uh, toward approaching this sacred building. This is the vista from the Senate side and I wanted to show you, you can, you can see all the way to Washington Monument again from the top where the white arrow is on the map. But when Olmsted planned this vista in 1873, Washington Monument was a stump. Uh, you may know the story that they, it was started, Washington Monument was started with private funds and they ran out of money and then there were some uh, uh, problems with the organization and so forth and they finally gave up. And so it sat there as a stub for 40 years. At the center of, of this great nation was this unfinished building uh, indicating the unfinished reality of our ideals. And it was only when the uh, Army Corps of Eng Engineers came along and finished the building in the 1880s that uh, we finally got Washington Monument as the symbol that it is today. So when Olmsted planned this, uh, Washington Monument <coughs> was uh, not nearly this high and uh, did not uh, dominate the city in quite the same way that it does, but he knew that it ought to and he created the frame for it even before it was built. And we'll see that. Now, <clears throat> Olmsted thought that the Capitol building <clears throat> uh, was not properly supported visually on the West Front. Of course, the, the building sits on the edge of the, of the plateau there. And um, 
And so he looked at it and this is what it looked like. It sat up on, a, on a, an artificial berm here uh, and there was a forest off to the right. I couldn't find a photograph of the, of the building with the forest for you to get a sense of what it was like uh, before Olmsted came along with his plan and created that wonderful uh, open space. But uh, he felt the building looked like it was fo floating up there and that it might slip off into the valley any time. And so he proposed marble terraces. And this is what the terraces looked like just after they were finished in about 1900. Uh, he had not, they had not started installing his plantings there along the wall. Uh, that, uh, uh, so it looks rather stark. But, uh, but this is what Olmsted planned. It took them 20 years to get the Congress to even approve it. Um, but he's the one that, that felt that it, it needed a grand entrance on that side, even though you can't get in the building there. Uh, so he created these wonderful staircases. Uh, unfortunately, they were, they were uh, polishing the marble for the inauguration when I went to take these pictures. So, so uh, this is a picture of the of one of the staircases, the one on the left. Uh, and it does not go anywhere. And of course, that's the way the, um, the rioters attacked the Capitol was going up this staircase uh, on January 6th. Uh, and uh, there isn't really any way to protect the building from, from things like that on this side at this point. And so the uh, security has kept us off the terrace uh, for the last um, 20 years or so. But uh, uh, it is a magnificent uh, entrance to that plaza anyway, and has become the, the site of the inauguration. Now, if you're down on the plaza itself, you can see the white arrow there where I took this shot. And this is what the plaza looks like. And the vista that I showed you is off to the left here. <clears throat> now, this kind of shows you the beginnings of replacing the Olmsted designed plantings. Um, they will be much more subtle and will not hide the terrace. They will, they will emphasize it. Uh, I'm going to shift now to, uh, you can see on the uh, drawing here where the, the green, where the white arrow is, the, where I took this shot. And now I'm going to shift slightly to the left and show you the, the uh, plantings uh, that have uh, outgrown their space and so probably will be, hopefully will be replaced over the next few years so that they don't obscure the building and the dome anymore. And that's the difference between uh, Olmsted, uh, whose plantings emphasize the building uh, aesthetically and those that, that hide it and overwhelm it. Now we get to the spring grotto, which I call Thomas Wisedale's hidden jewel. Thomas Wisedell was an architect who worked for uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, and he's responsible for a lot of the designs of the street furniture. Uh, those uh, uh, low benches that I showed you at the top with the red, white, and blue, and the walkways, again, with the red, white, and blue. And this is probably Wisedell's most famous uh, addition to the Capitol. It is called the Spring Grotto. Uh, and uh, this is as it appears from where the white arrow is on that um, map on the left. Uh, it's very low. Um, I've had people tell me that they passed that uh, uh, on their jogging run for, for decades and never noticed it. But uh, uh, it is really in some way, it almost looks like a tomb here. Uh, but in fact, it's a very inviting space. Uh, there are plantings around it and now they they uh, plant azaleas and so forth and, and some nice trees to emphasize it. But um, this is as it appears on the right. There's a fountain in the center. The fountain was not going when I took this picture, uh, but it kind of splashes water and makes a nice sound and, and uh, fills the, the air there with cooling water. So on a really hot summer day, going an August day when it's 95 out, and it's more like 75 in here and a, and a wonderful, very pleasant place to stop. But Olmsted, of course, is planning what you're going to do in there. And uh, he's got this wonderful uh, stone screen. But he doesn't want you laying down in here. And so he puts arm rests between the, the seats there to let you know that you're supposed to be sitting up and looking at the fountain and contemplating it. But it's 
wonderful, cool place to relax. And on a hot summer day, it'll be full of people. Now, Olmsted, of course, is all about trees and, and uh, uh, he planted thousands of trees on the Capitol grounds. Uh, he designed labels for the trees because he wanted to use them as an educational uh, function. Uh, on the left, you can see the, the labels, the way he planned them with that brown unobtrusive color. Uh, and uh, he's got the Latin name and the common name and the family and the uh, uh, native habitat of it. But they found out that the insects like to get behind these um, sign these uh, labels and attack the tree. So now they fix the labels so that they stick out away from the tree and that's what I'm showing with you with the right right hand photograph here. This is one of Olmsted's fa most famous trees, most favorite trees I should say, the Japanese pagoda tree. It's not native to the United States but it is native to this climate and uh, and it loves the climate so it grows huge but it has tiny leaves. Now, the leaves hadn't grown out when I was coming by in the spring, and so I only got this one branch of leaves, but that gives you an idea of how small the leaves are. Olmsted was looking at the shadows that the trees make, and the Japanese pagoda tree made a wonderful dappled shadow, and so he uses the oaks and other trees that have dark shadows and, con and contrasts them with the, uh, with the dappled shadows of the Japanese pagoda tree and other trees with small leaves, so that he's even painting his picture and painting the shadows with the types of trees that he uses. Now we plant some memorial trees today, but we try to always follow Olmsted's plan with them, but they wanted to label them separately. They have all the same um, information that Olmsted's label does, but we need to put on the people um, the tree to the left is in honor of Anne Frank uh, and sponsored by uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, on the right is the tree in honor of Emmett Till uh, and sponsored by Senator Susan Collins. So that information gets on here, but we keep it as unobtrusive as we can uh, to not detract too much from the experience. Olmsted also liked ginkgos and many of the parks that he designed uh, in the late 19th century had ginkgos. This is the most magnificent ginkgo on the um, Capitol grounds. It's between the Capitol and the Supreme Court there and uh, uh, is, is a wonderful specimen. Usually ginkgos are smaller and narrower than this one, but this one has been uh, taken very good care of throughout its history. And so uh, uh, it is there on the Capitol grounds. This is the way it was last a year ago in the spring. Now, the cherries and the dogwoods are not Olmsted plantings. Um, he didn't want a, a lot of blossoms on the Capitol grounds um, because he felt they detracted from the Capitol. The purpose of the landscape is to uh, emphasize the Capitol building. So I'm not sure he would approve, but we do have cherries and dogwoods uh, on the Capitol grounds today. The stone decorations, I showed, showed you some of them. Uh, earlier. Uh, I want to show them up close. These are by and large the work of Thomas Wisedell. Uh, on the left you can see this sandstone cap uh, on the stone wall. This, all of this uh, is on the lower um, west front uh, entrance. Uh, if you look underneath the lip of the top on the left you can see that they have carved a, a cane of a rose in there. Uh, and as though it were be tr being trained to grow along the wall, but it's actually done in sandstone. It's an interesting motif kind of hidden underneath there, and the sandstone hasn't uh, survived too well in the, in the uh, uh, weather around here and the air pollution that was so bad for so long. Uh, so it doesn't look too good, but, the, but uh, you can see on the right, these uh, granite carvings are wonderful and give, give you the sense that you're approaching a sacred space. <clears throat> Here are a couple more views of it. You can see a couple of layers of different kinds of walls and then these wonderful lanterns um, on the top. Of course, we have to have signage today. We get so many visitors. And so they at least uh, for this rather obtrusive sign, they used the, the brown color 
that Olmsted had prescribed for the labels for the trees. And they provide you with the, the information that you need to, to uh, get where you want to go on the Capitol grounds. Uh, and it's tr intrusive and directive, which Olmsted would not have been, uh, but uh, uh, necessary for the use that we put the Capitol to now. And probably he would be approving at least of what we have done uh, with that necessity. The stone towers, there are two of these, one on each side for the House and the Senate. They were originally designed as air intakes. And uh, so they were there already and he needed to, to uh, uh, deal with them in his designs. So they wouldn't stand out too much. You can see what he did with them just kind of makes them appear that they pop up there. And now of course there are security cameras uh, on the top there, but they have to stay in the landscape. But he's in included them in the plan so that they don't look like they're uh, too unnatural. This is what the building looked like at the bottom and the, uh, it looks from here, uh, you're looking from the mall back to the Capitol, it looks like that fountain uh, is slightly off center. And in fact it is, but it is that fountain that is true west from the Capitol. And Olmsted put it there because the mall had not been designed yet. And uh, you probably know that the that Washington Monument had to be off center on the mall because the ground was too soft uh, at the at the uh, location where one would naturally expect it to be. So they put them they put Washington Monument slightly to the south of due west from the Capitol building. Well, um, uh, Olmsted didn't know, of course, what design they were going to have for the mall. Couldn't have dreamed that they would do what they did with it. And so he put his fountain due west, but now it seems off center because in fact, the mall uh, is skewed slightly to the south from the center. <laughs> now there is a lot of published material about um, Homestead and uh, I wanted to give you some idea of it. Uh, hopefully people will get interested in this and, uh, uh, and want to read more. So I thought I would share with you some of the uh, documentation that's available. The popular biography, Genius of Place, written by Justin Martin, uh, is the place I would start for any understanding of Olmsted, gives you the facts, but in an interesting uh, story. Uh, to the right uh, is um, Frederick well, Olmsted designing the American landscape by Charles Beveridge and Paul Rochelieu. Charles Beveridge was the editor of the Frederick Law Olmsted Papers, a project that is now complete, but he, uh, Beveridge has spent much of his life uh, turning out 10 volumes and, and lots and lots of, of other uh, uh, books, including this one, uh, which gives you lots of, of uh, photographs and explanations of uh, Olmsted's uh, ideas and accomplishments in, in landscapes. Uh, FLO, a biography of Frederick Law Olmsted with, by Laura Wood Roper, uh, is also a good, more detailed book about uh, uh, Olmsted's life. I stuck this photograph on the right because this is the Olmsted National Historic Site as it looked when the National Park Service took it over. Uh, Olmsted liked having ivy on his house, but that is a clabbered house, and the ivy was growing and ruining the clabbards and destroying the house. And so the Park Service had to begin with the problem of how in the world they were going to deal with all of this um, ivy and give the feel of the house without uh, uh, allowing it to be destroyed by the ivy. So finally, it came up with a, a lattice of, uh, of wire that is out away from the house just enough so that the ivy does not uh, get onto the clabbards, but they can restore the ivy as Olmsted loved it. Uh, I have been to visit this historic site. I recommend it very highly. Uh, uh, it, it is a miniature Olmsted uh, landscape itself with a whole variety of experiences just in a small plot of land. And, uh, and then the, uh, the Olmsted papers and the, the um, uh, displays that they do explain things like the day I was there. Um, they were showing off the technology that, Olm that the Olmsted firm used. Apparently they didn't throw anything away. And so uh, you have all of the old cameras and the, and the experimental use of blueprints and, and uh, they had all the latest technology. They would actually take a photograph of a landscape, of course in black and white, 
And then they would draw on the photograph to show the client what they could do with that landscape and the possibilities there. It's just an amazing use of technology so early uh, in the history of photography. And uh, that and, and all of the other innovations they had. For instance, Olmsted got a, a typewriter made that would type only one line and that would go on the edge of the photograph. So it was a, a typewriter, especially for typing on the edges of photographs. Uh, so I highly recommend that as a wonderful um, way of, of paying respect to this man and his accomplishment and the career of him and the firm that he set up with his two sons and, uh, and their successors. Now, the last two volumes of the Frederick Law Olmsted papers are special, what they call supplementary series. There are three of them. And these two are the picture books. These books are both um, coffee table sized books with magnificent photographs and divided into two parts. The one on the left is the um, plans and views of public parks. And this of course are, are, is uh, Olmsted's signature um, accomplishment of the public parks all over the country uh, that he designed. On the right, it's private estates and and developments. Now the photograph there is in fact a colorized version of the Chicago World's Fair. Uh, so that, is, that is, is, is his last great accomplishment in many ways, his greatest there, uh, this most successful World's Fair in history. Um, on the left, uh, a clearing in the distance, Frederick Law Olmsted and America in the 19th century. Vitold Rybczynski, um, talks about Olmsted as, and fits him in the context of the times. It is a wonderful, very different view uh, than you get to, from just a biography. On the right is the, the catalog of the Olmsted firm's design projects. Those 6,000 um, projects are, uh, are a catalog in this uh, book. Uh, so one can go in and look by state and by locality and know which designs were actually were made, not necessarily carried out. Uh, but if you want to know um, a particular location, uh, this also, also is online available. But this is the kind of documentation that's, that is available for people today uh, to look at Olmsted and begin to get a sense of his impact. So I want to go back to the quotation again. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted, According to Daniel Burnham, an artist, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. And what a wonderful contrib contribution this has made to America. His legacy, Central Park in New York City, the American Red Cross, the National Park Service, I'm not gonna read all of this, but this gives you an idea of the scope of just this one man. And then we cannot leave out his son, Rick Olmsted, Frederick Jr., born in 1870, died in 1957. He carried on with the Olmsted brothers firm with his uh, stepbrother, John Charles. And uh, amongst all of them, these 6,000 projects, his first big project was with the Macmillan Commission. Uh, the partners from the Chicago World's Fair uh, were brought to Washington to rebuild the, build the city uh, based on the success of the Chicago World's Fair. And they're the ones who built the mall that we have today. Uh, so the National Mall, now the zoo used to be in the middle of the mall, so they, so Olmsted had to design uh, his father and then the son helped carry it out, uh, the National Zoo that we have today. And of course the major walk down through the zoo is called Olmsted Walk. The Macmillan Commission was a, was a senator who put together a plan for uh, a commission that would plan the parks uh, for Washington, D.C. And um, they uh, then proposed and got established the National Capital Planning Commission, which has been the major um, uh, enforcer of the plan. Uh, again, Olmsted knew that these plans have to be carried out over generations. And so they even, uh, this is Rick Olmsted, uh, even commissioned this, uh, established the US Commission on Fine Arts to make sure that some uh, aesthetic input goes into the creating of federal buildings all over the country and indeed all over the world. 
Rock Creek Park here in Washington, D.C. was largely designed by uh, Rick Olmsted. Forest Hill Garden in Queen, New York. Queens, New York is considered one of the great uh, suburbs in America, and it was done, done, done and planned by Rick Olmsted. Uh, and down at the bottom of Palos Verdes Estates in Los Angeles. That's where Rick Olmsted actually lived and is one of, the, one of his great uh, plans. He helped establish the Harvard Graduate School of Design, particularly the Department of Landscape, Architecture and Design, and the uh, Department of Urban Planning and Design, because of course, if you're designing parks, then, then you uh, uh, have to be involved in urban planning. And so he's one of the founders of the urban planning profession uh, in, uh, in the United States. The National Seashore Program, I found that out by going down to Assateague Island, which I love, uh, in uh, Virginia. And uh, there was a plaque to Rick Olmsted as having done this, the design, uh, the plan, uh, the study that created the National Seashore Program. And then finally, the Cal California State Park Commission uh, was also something he was behind. Um, he's the father of American city planning, and I've put uh, some of his uh, triumphs there. Uh, and now it's time to find out if I have stimulated anybody to uh, have questions or make, make comments about this. Well, you, you certainly have, Steve, but uh, before we focus on the Capitol, will you verify that the, that the, his home is indeed in Brookline? Massachusetts. Yes, it is in Brookline. The Ivy now, College. Structure. I'm not an expert, but I took the I took the, the train out there, and everybody says it's in Brookline, so um, that's what that's what my understanding. Okay. Is. All right. All right, Steve. Could a lot of the uh, attendees want to focus on the current situation at the Capitol? Was there damage to the grounds because of the situation on January 6th. What is the security update right now? And will that include input from the U.S. historical, from the Capitol Historical Society? Uh, first of all, there was no damage that I know of. Uh, the, uh, the inauguration uh, was set up at the time. And uh, uh, so it was all being protected from crowds that uh, eventually couldn't come. Uh, and uh, so, in fact, there was no damage to the, to the grounds that I'm aware of. The, they, uh, uh, I know that the rioters went up the steps and broke some windows, but there's nothing, but uh, as far as I know, there's no damage to the, to the outside. I haven't read about any, I mean, it's possible, but uh, uh, no, no damage. Um, However, there's a big, there are lots of big issues and, of course, a complete turnover in, in uh, responsible officials uh, that deal with the Capitol and Capitol grounds. So I have no idea um, when they're going to take down the rest of the fence or when the building will be accessible to the public. I'm pretty sure, I think I can say that the, um, that the grounds will be accessible much sooner than the building itself. But I, um, Nobody seems to know. Uh, it's a moving target, of course, with the people targeting Capitol policemen and so forth. So uh, uh, there's a lot of work to be done before decisions get made about um, what's to happen. Uh, the U.S. Capitol Historical Society is um, has no official role with the planning. Uh, we do have input, uh, but it's not official. Um, and we can say that the people that uh, are in charge at the Capitol building are immensely qualified and um, respectful of Olmstead uh, and of the, of the access to the building, which of course is emphasized by, um, by Olmstead's plan. And so um, I don't have a great deal of concern. I think they know what they're doing and will will be respectful uh, of it. All right. Um, Does that answer all of, I think yes. that answers all yes. of yeah. several okay. people. Several people have focused on the grotto, all the photos you showed of that. Is it available now? Is it behind security? Is it situated over a natural spring? Um, 
it is not accessible now. When the fence comes down, it should be. Um, there, are, there was a spring on the topographical map that I've seen that predates the Capitol building itself, um, but uh, the water has always been pumped, just as that wonderful spring that uh, river that flows through Central Park is in fact pumped water uh, in, uh, in New York City, but it is, all of that water is uh, city water. All right, um, there's a lot of interest in the trolley. Is that now a bus stop? Uh, no, the bus is, in fact, the bus is not, not even allowed on Constitutional or in Independence Avenue. I guess the city bus, finally they, they began to allow city buses, but they're not allowed to stop anywhere along there and certainly not to get on the Capitol grounds and never will. The trolleys were taken down about 1961 or 62. Uh, there was a problem because they'd never been allowed to string wires uh, across the buildings. And so unlike, as I understand it, any other city in the country, the, all of the wires for the trolleys were buried to begin with. And uh, that didn't work in the snow and, and, and with the gravel and so forth getting down and shorting out the, the electric, electricity. So it was a continuing problem. Uh, and so when the Congress bailed out the, the um, uh, trolley system, uh, they required uh, that, the, um, uh, that all of the, the uh, underground wiring be, be removed and that, the, that uh, buses be used. And so it's been buses ever since uh, in the 60s. All right, focusing now on the lamps. Um, you mentioned some of them were, did Olmsted um, design all of them or were some of them gifted from other countries in as much as some of them look like a pagoda design, i.e. an um, Asian influence? Yes, no, all, all of them are Olmsted designs. I'm not aware of any gifts and uh, um, I'm pretty sure the policy is no gifts on the Capitol grounds. Uh, they, they made the mistake once of, of uh, naming a carillon that was already planned uh, after Senator Taft because he died at the right time. Uh, but uh, the policy is no, nothing more than memorial trees uh, on the Capitol grounds. Uh, so those, those uh, lamps are all designed by, um, by Thomas Wisedell for Frederick Law Olmsted's firm. Uh, it's worth noting that at that time in our history, there was a, a concept, design concept called chinoiserie. Uh, Chinese design was very fashionable in France, and so we, um, uh, we used the French uh, term for Chinese design uh, at that time, and that clearly is that. It clearly is uh, Oriental influence, but it's not fashionable today and uh, kind of sticks out and certainly dates the the street furniture uh, on the Capitol grounds. All right, next question has to do with the construction of, of, his, of his involvement in the construction of Central Park. Yes. You mentioned that um, <laughs> he, he was the supervisor of that. Did yes. he have any experience in any kind of construction? Because it seems like he only, his <laughs> only background was a writer in order to do that. Uh, he had he had used uh, crews to uh, in his farming, uh, his scientific farming, and uh, and that was the background. But what happened with Central Park is that it was heavily involved with patronage employees of the city, and Olmsted understood how to handle them. He he's he's really brilliant in his understanding of the politics of making public decisions. And so uh, he did such a masterful job of, of uh, organizing the crews at Central Park that those same people decided that he should organize the U.S. Sanitary Commission that was in, involved enormous numbers of employees and, and patronage. And so he continues with that as he does, does other city, other parks city by city. Uh, he, he looks at the uh, at the employment situation and the, and the political structure and the way decisions are made and deals with that accordingly, doesn't fight it. And how savvy was he in negotiating with Congress about the designs and the appropriated budget for this project? Um, 
the McMillan Commission was uh, was Senator McMillan, and uh, and in what Olmstead did, there were usually senators involved, Justin Morrill, uh, and other uh, other senators were involved, and so nothing went anywhere without uh, without some member of Congress behind it. Now we know that uh, Speaker Cannon. Uh, who's considered the most powerful speaker in American history and the most capricious in a lot of ways, um, opposed the tariffs on the West Front. And there were a lot of, of uh, uh, penny-pinching congressmen who opposed putting this marble terrace there. And so they had to kind of sneak it in. Uh, that in itself is a story which I don't know very well. But uh, uh, he was all, there was always involved in, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, sort of getting around the opponents of the things that he did. Although there doesn't seem to have been much of that at the beginning. Uh, there was a recognition that they had a problem. They had enlarged the Capitol grounds enormously and that's what, what he was uh, designed to, uh, was retained to design. But uh, uh, we know that the, the terraces were built much later. Uh, in fact, when Olmsted himself couldn't really uh, supervise them uh, because of because of politics. So it took a while. I think they were built in a couple of parts and so forth. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. The west the west front is where the concerts are held. Yes, they are today. Now they originated yes. on the east front. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, today that is that is where the concert concerts are held and where the inauguration is held. They moved the inauguration from the Right. East Front to the West Front. And, and in many ways, that is a tribute to Frederick Law Olmsted because he designed, uh, the, or all of us saw the designing of that, um, of the frame, the, the setting for the inauguration today. All right. Please clarify the relationship between the Sanitary Commission and Olmsted's commission to design the parks surrounding the Capitol. Um, Olmsted had, had uh, first received this commission to design the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm getting this backwards. Olmsted had, had uh, uh, been involved with Central Park and those people hired him to do the Sanitary Commission. He was here in Washington doing the Sanitary Commission, but his mind was never settled. And uh, he came up with what Washington could look like uh, when he was here during the war. Uh, afterwards, he goes off and designs Prospect Park in Brooklyn and, and uh, other park systems. And then he's hired to, uh, by, he is so famous that he's hired to do the Capitol grounds. So the, the, um, uh, the Sanitary Commission uh, ha has no real connection with the Capitol grounds at all, other than that's when he came up with the concepts and when, when they, wanted him to design the Capitol grounds, he tried to convince them to, uh, to include the area where the mall is now. And they said, no, you need to limit yourself to the Capitol grounds. So he was already coming up with the ideas that then his son implemented. Does that clarify? Yes. And tell, and uh, uh, one of the viewers asked you to elaborate, what is scientific farming? Ah. Uh, Having grown up in farm country, that's, uh, that's not a question I would uh, plan on answering, but uh, no, scientific farming is as opposed to traditional farming. Uh, traditional farming followed the, the uh, sort of folk learning over time, whereas, uh, uh, in, in fact, it's amazing reading the history of the Department of Agriculture that it was formed as a scientific organization. And most of the scientists in the government were in the agriculture department because they wanted to learn how to uh, improve agriculture and, and make better use of resources. And so uh, uh, scientific farming uh, is trying to, to um, use the processes of science to, to improve farming, uh, whereas farmers themselves were generally more traditional. Are you familiar with um, Olmsted's design of Shelburne Farms in Vermont? Um, I know that it's famous, but I, I haven't been there and, and I do not know 
uh, much about the design, but that is one of the designs that co that's covered in the in the books. Yes, and and speaking of the bibliography, um, it would um, would you be comfortable sharing that? And I can uh, um, put that in the newsletter. There are several folks who would like to do some follow up. Um. Just Googling Olmstead should get you to the National Park Service site. And then, or, or you can go through Olmstead 200's uh, um, dot org. All right. And of course, we're all interested in knowing when, if you do know when, the Historical Society will offer tours of the grounds. Um, Any kind of update on that? Uh, there's nothing to offer. Uh, we, we do not anticipate. Uh, we'll start as soon as the fence comes down. So um, uh, our website is uschs.org. And uh, uh, as soon as the fence comes down, um, but we, we have not heard any indication that it's coming down anytime soon. All right, so I think we've answered all the questions here. Let me slide through here one more time to make sure that I haven't overlooked anyone. I think that's it, Steve. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.